big stories. First, bed bugs and now rodents. Social media erupts once more over another pest sighting at the Naia. This time, it's a rat scurrying across the ceiling at a boarding area in Terminal 3. Recent hacking incidents have raised concerns about the security of personal data shared with state agencies. What is the government doing about it? We'll find out from National Privacy Commission Chair Leandro Aguirre later on in the show. And Mr. Pure Energy, Gary Valenciano, is closing the chapter on 40 years in show business with a huge farewell concert. Welcome to the show. I'm Regina Lai. I'm Gretchen Wong. And I'm Sean Yao. Okay. <laughs> First day of March, Friday the Friday. I certainly hope you're not having dinner while watching this because the big story tonight is about another pest. That's right. First it was bed bugs. Now we're talking rats in Naia. You all might have seen this. A social media user was able to capture this video of a rat scurrying along the ceiling of Naia's Terminal 3. He zooms out, I mean the social media user zooms out at one point to show that he was indeed at the airport and that there were other passengers waiting to board. The Manila International Airport Authority told One News that they will review their contract with the pest control provider and possibly cancel it if they find any lapses. We will be reviewing the service agreement of our pest control anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, titingnan po natin kung merong lapses dito. No? Uh, taking into consideration itong video na ito, if we will establish na merong kapabayaan dito, magkakansila po tayo ng mga kontrata kung hindi po magagawa ng tama ang serbisyo. It was certainly not nice waking up to that video uh, which has gone viral on X and has gotten over a million views uh, in that platform alone. You know, it's on social media, of course, we're quick to react. Some poked fun at the incident saying, baka naman daw may flight yung taga. O, oh, meron pa ka nagsabi na baka ano, magmamigrate na yung taga. Akala ko ba kaya hinahantay ka niyang dumati? <laughs> And <laughs> some called Searching for a better it, life. Uh, ratatouille. ratatouille. <laughs> Kasi daw yung, uh, yung surot e eh, French. <laughs> Tapos ito, Suro. may, may oh, sumunod. Oh, got it. That's why they yeah. call it French. Okay, got it. <laughs> Others meanwhile think it was an intentional move to plant the rat there. Oh, may flat earthers na naman with conspiracy theories. Oh, with any issues really, but uh, you know, we were just talking to Attorney Chris Bendijo of the Manila International Airport Authority yesterday. They said they do quarterly cleaning of the facilities. Four even times before, a year. Let's even face before it, guys. this all broke out. Okay, let's face it. This is a tropical country. Rodents and pests are yes. very much a big part of life. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, there are buildings where even if you do regular pest control, mm. meron talagang true, true. It's also the hygiene. Mm. Okay. And high traffic. High and traffic. And the humidity. O oh, baka sumama sa luggage ng passenger coming in. Pwede you know, From a different country. <laughs> Wait, pero <laughs> ano, ano yung theory mo kanina? May theory ka rin eh. Uh, usually kasi no, pag nag-spray no. ka ng pest mm. control, um, you target their nests or where they live, yung mga kwarto of nila, course. mga pugad nila. And usually, yun nga, it sends the pests scurrying outside. Which is a very good point. That happens with roaches, mm -hmm. with uh, bed bugs, right? Yes. You you target the nests. Also rats. Nest. Well, nest. The nests. Maybe yeah. we should let the cats in. <laughs> <laughs> they tried that already really in have? New York. No, they tried that in New York. And you know what? After a while, they put so much CCTV cameras in those basement units. And they found out after a while, they learned to coexist. Uh, oh my God. Yeah, exactly. Learned to coexist. And, and you know what? New York without rats is not New York. Oh, okay. And neither is and, Naia. <laughs> we don't want, we want don't. that to be our tagline. <laughs> of course, after the news broke, what did passengers who were at the Naia at that time think about this latest sighting? News 5's Marian Enriquez actually went there herself to find out for us. Go ahead, man. Needless to say, Sean, Naia is indeed the talk of the town once more with this rat issue. We got to talk to some OFWs and airport passengers about Naia's unwanted guests, and they all agree that it's not a good look for the Philippines. It's a shameful, no? Doon naman sa Abu Dhabi yung connecting flight ko, wala naman ganito kasi ako observer naman ako sa... Sa Rome, wala ka din ng ganito. Only in the Philippines. Ako mandidiri talaga ako kasi syempre, sino ba naman gusto may daga dito sa Naia? Kasi alam naman natin ng Pilipino, malilinis. Tapos uh, talagang puntahan ng turista. 
uh, nakakaya din sa mga foreigner na makakita ng may daga. May makikita ka talagang malalaking ganyan sa mga pananim kasi naghahanap sila ng food which is normal. Pero siguro pag, pag nandito na sa ganitong airport, syempre ma, parang... Ano, magugulat ka talaga na bakit may ganun dito. Questionin mo na ano, pa, yung paglilinis dito parang hindi talaga ano eh, hindi na maximize talaga. Aside from netizens, there is also concern coming from the lower house. Ating mga parang ay hindi lamang gateway po sa ating tourism industry, kundi pati na po sa ating labor migration. Bigyan naman po natin ang kanampatang atensyon ang lahat ng ito. Sean, Representative Maxino said she is looking to file a resolution to have the lower house investigate the maintenance activities in several airports. Over in the upper chamber, Public Services Committee Chairperson Senator Grace Poe has also spoken up about the recent issues hounding the NAIA. She said that while infestation is a global problem affecting countries like France, airport officials should step up and ensure the sanitation of our public facilities. Sean. Thank you so much for that, Maan and Enriquez. Ako talagang France ang napagtuunan ng pansin, ano? No, you said it, I didn't say it. Hindi, si Maan nagsabi. Si Senator Grace Poe din, abanggitin niya. Because they were the last to be on the headlines. You know, that's how conspiracy theories begin. Pero alam mo, itong yung giant surot nakita sa phone cam, that's unheard of. Because normally, you don't see bed bugs. Uh, Kasi kung may nakita ka dito, so mo lamang hindi bed bugs yun. Oh, you know what? That's the other, other point. point. Maybe it's oh, mutated. Okay, maybe maybe it's so a different scared. species. Hindi, pero galing ako sa Paris recently. I asked about that problem. Ang sabi naman sa akin nung nagda-drive, Pinoy yun eh. Sabi niya, naku, hindi naman totoo yun. Parang pinalaki lang ng media. Baka siguro yeah. one incident lang. Yeah. That's the other side of it. Okay. <laughs> well, in any case, here to talk us through the potential impact on the tourism industry, we have with us live via Zoom, Tourism Congress of the Philippines President James Montenegro. James, good evening. Thanks for being with us. Hi, good evening. Thank you for inviting. Yeah, so let me take off from what we were just talking about, the rat sighting in the Naia. Obviously not a good look, obviously quite shameful for us, another black mark on our reputation, but uh, give us a better sense of what you guys in the tourism industry are saying about this. Um, for one, I think I, I'm hoping that, again, this is not a, it, it doesn't become a major issue and it's an isolated issue to one of our airports. And I, I believe and I hope that the airport authorities take 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 this seriously and start um, go and do a major fumigation of our airports. It's just not definitely not good for our image, as it affects our hygiene and cleanliness standards of our facilities as well. Well, uh, James. It happened in Paris, a big bed bug supposedly, quote-unquote, might have been overblown. A bed bug incident in Fashion Week, and uh, we don't see tourist arrivals there going down. Um, that just uh, shows me that maybe it's not that per se, but how big of a factor is an airport when tourists p pick a place to visit? Does it rank up there uh, in terms of considerations for tourists? It does. It does rank. Um, I think more than that, it, it, because it's the main gateway to the country. Fortunately, we have other gateways now that are much better operated, like the Clark International Airport and the Cebu International Airport, who who have been newly renovated. And I think, from our perspective in the tourist industry, we're happy that this airport is finally going to be privatized eventually, and hopefully, the standards of this airport improve. Speaking of rehabilitation, uh, we know that the NAIA uh, bid was won by the San Miguel Corporation. Um, what is your wish list uh, when it comes to rehabilitating our main gateway? For one, I hope the cleanliness really improves and the way the facilities are operated, that they go up to international standards, the east, east of check-in, the, the accessibility to the airport, as you know, certain times, especially Terminal 3, it's it's a major issue getting to the terminal. So I hope the, the circulation around the airport improves as well so that it will be easier for our people to get in and out of those airports. All right, James, uh, can you give us a picture of like how uh, tour agencies or tour operators uh, work 
uh, in and around or at least around the NAIA issue. Um, you mentioned the Clark Airport, which is brand spanking new, lots of capacity. Of course, the Cebu Airport also got a facelift not too long ago. Uh, do you just suggest to tourists for them to fly straight there if, for example, someone's headed anyway to like Bohol or Dumaguete? Do you suggest like, oh, just fly straight to Cebu or to Clark? Um, a lot of tour operators try to shy away from Manila because of the um, accessibility issues, the traffic and all that. But, but the issue we have with the other airports is that the, the amount of flights going to those airports are still limited. So hopefully in the near future, um, we will have more flights to these key destinations and gateway cities like Cebu, Clark, and hopefully even up to Boracay so that it will improve the accessibility for our tourists. Because one of our challenges really is our cost of travel within the country is also very expensive. Mm -hmm. As against our neighboring country, against our neighbors like uh, Thailand and Malaysia, mm -hmm. and that, um, that's actually correct. Uh, Vietnam. Uh, that's I right. I went to Vietnam, and there were so many backpackers there who said that everything is interconnected, the transportation. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, you have to ride one plane to another city and then another plane again. Um, is the tourism department uh, working on that part uh, of of of? Um, setting up the infrastructure, are you hearing anything uh, to that end? And also decongesting the airport, um, I think Sean has a good point there. Um, there's a huge opportunity also, um, it seems, in having those direct flights. I think the hindrance right now is the avail availability of planes for some of our two key airlines. So I think once we get over that hurdle, we should see more flights to destinations like Cebu, um, hopefully Clark as well. And that will ease up the, the, the traffic in Manila as well. So we're ho that's what we're hoping in the tourism industry, at least. Are you guys uh, being consulted in this? Um, well, it's still early days. They haven't even signed the memorandum of understanding uh, for the airport to hand over to the San Miguel-led consortium. But would you guys like to be consulted on the rehabilitation of the gateway? Um, yes, we can always. We're always happy to give our opinion. Um, the Tourism Congress is, uh, represents the various uh, sectors of the industry, travel agencies, airline operators, and all of that. So, we have people. We have people in our board that represent the airline industry as well. So, the more consultations we have with the operators, the better it is for the industry. I believe. James, um, speaking of, we've been talking about all this, but I forgot to, ano, no, kamustahin ko lang, kamusta na ba ang recovery ng tourism sector post-pandemic? The DOT, it says here in my notes, targeting 7.7 .7 million arrivals this year. That is still markedly lower than pre-pandemic levels. Can you guys say that we have actually recovered? If not, where are we on recovery? Um, I, think, I think they surpassed their 2023 uh, numbers which is good. Um, the recovery of the tourism industry, I think also is, is linked to the number of flights coming into the country and the cost of tickets as well. On the other side, I believe the tourism, uh, Department of Tourism has done a good job in promoting the country. Um, when we go out to the, the fairs in, in, in Europe, the feedback we get from the travel agencies is that they all wanna come to the Philippines. Um, we're seeing a lot of other gateway cities opening up as well. Uh, in Cebu, for example, we're seeing more Australians, uh, more Europeans coming into Cebu. So the, the market is, well, is as well shifting, and that's a good sign. Um, in Boracay, uh, we started to see an increase in tourism activity again um, in the early part of, in the middle part of 2023. There was a slowdown in tourism, and to, but fortunately, towards the end of the year, we saw uh, up, uh, uptake in the number of tourists arriving into the island. And also the quality of tourists has also improved, um, especially since Burakta has uh, reduced some of the regulations and it's become more free and there's a lot more activity in the island. So that also helped the tourism industry as well in the place. Sorry, can you expand on that? What, do you, what exactly do you mean by the quality of the tourists has also ex improved? Um, uh, well, a lot of uh, in the past, we, you know, sometimes when you get uh, too many tourists from one sector, whether that be China, uh, Korea, or China and Korea, the the the, the tourism spend is not as big, right? Because the, the the there could be more budget travel. So now, if we have a better mix of tourists between mm. Australians, 
a more equal mix, maybe is a better term for it, then the, the spend of each tourist is, go, starts to go up. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, what do you think has been working for the Department of Tourism in getting uh, more from Australia, more from Europe to come over? I think I think the recent activity that they've done in Europe, um, they've been very active in the trade fairs in Europe, mm. um, in the key trade fairs, and they've been very active in trying to secure more travels, travel uh, more more travel agencies to the country, and that's really helped bring in more interest to the country. Is is love the Philippines campaign? I mean, a part of that. I mean, what's been the feedback? Is, it, has, yeah. is yeah. there a recall at least, or do do they prefer the previous one? Um, I think I think in general the, the feedback has been quite good for a lot of the Philippines and I think that people that, that, that when we talk to the travel agencies um, they're they're appreciative of the slogan and they understand it it's simpler to understand and it's more in line with what we have to offer as well when it comes to raising a country's profile for the purposes of tourism do ads work um, uh, case in point the ads that they put out in uh, on the buses in London or in Melbourne, uh, do these things work? Or they create a lot of interest, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, the ads that we put out, whether they're in um, uh, the major shows or in major major publications, they do work. They create interest. But as you know, the biggest impact really is really social media, and the, the Department of Tourism has been very active in social media as well, and they've also been active in inviting um, bloggers, vloggers to the country. To help talk about the mm. the um, our, our our tourism facilities and our places, right? Oh wow, that's interesting. So social media is also the new frontier for uh, tourism. It is. It is. Yes. For influencer, elections official and influencer yeah. campaigns, yeah. Right. I guess. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna have to leave that there. We thank you so much for your insights. Uh, thank that you. Was tourism Congress of the Philippines President James Montenegro. In other news, Iloilo and Oriental Mindoro are among the two provinces that will be hit hardest by El Nino this year. The Agriculture Department says crop damage caused by El Nino in Iloilo has already hit 127 million pesos, while losses recorded in Oriental Mindoro were pegged at around 56 million pesos. But the Oriental Mindoro local government's own estimates of crop damage is much higher than that. The LGU says 350 million pesos worth of palay and other high-value crops were damaged in the province because of the drought and that this affected around 1,600 farmers in the entire province. And the town of Bulalacao in Oriental Menorah has already declared an El Nino state of calamity and the town of Mansalay is also considering the same. Oriental Mindoro Governor Bons Dolor says that while rice supply has not been affected, supplies of other crops like melon and, melon and onions are now at risk. The LGU is now preparing to distribute aid to farmers affected by the drought. Labis-labis ang supply ng bigas sa Oriental Mindoro. Hindi sa magkukulang. Puproduce ang bayan ng mansalay ng napakaraming tons of melon. Dahil labis ito, ini-export namin ito sa Batangas. But because of El Nino, yung posibilidad ng pag-export kung hindi man totaling mawala, malaki ang mababawas. Yung Sibuyas na dati kami number 8 top producing province ng Sibuyas, maaaring bumaba ito dahil sa El Nino. Uh, if two or three LGUs... Then we can declare a province-wide state of calamity, particularly on those municipalities affected and might be affected. The News 5 team headed over to Oriental Mindoro to check the situation on the ground. And JC Cosico joins us now to give us the details. JC, kamusta mga farmers dyan? Reg, we visited the town of Mansale earlier and what we did us were dried up crops and parched and cracked fields. We spoke to one of the affected farmers, Vicente. He said that from harvesting some 120 cavans of rice during the harvest season, now it's down to 40. Hindi maganda ang production ng butil ng palay. Maraming ipa. Ibig sabihin po no? Eh, walang suportang tubig eh. Logi talaga. Sana nga po matulungan kami ng gobyerno. 
Some other farmers we spoke to had it worse. Remelin says she wasn't able to make any harvest at all. That's why her husband was forced to look for other sources of income. Farmers in the area are also struggling to find sources of water with less rainfall due to the El Nino. Only five barangays in the area are being serviced by the National Irrigation Administration or NIA. Yung iba kasi ang pinagkukunan po nila ay open source lang, mga creeks, rivers, ganyan po. Kaya po, pag nawala talaga ang ulan at na, na, naiga, wala na talaga silang mapagkukunan ng patubig. Apart from palay, other crops like bananas were also affected. The Agriculture Office of the LGU pegs damage in the town alone at 75 million pesos with over 400 farmers affected. Reg, the Agriculture Department and other agencies have distributed seeds to farmers so they can resume planting once the dry season is over. Now, the LGU has also talked to the DA for the construction of more irrigation facilities in the area. Now, the provincial government will also buy new drilling machines to dig up water from the ground. Back to you. Thanks so much for that, JC. Well, up next, after a series of hacking attempts and breaches on government websites, the question is, how secure is our personal data? We'll speak with National Privacy Commission Deputy Privacy Commissioner Leandro Aguirre about this right after the break. Welcome back. You're still watching The Big Story here on One News. The Philippines placed 30th among 163 countries with the most accounts that were breached in 2023. Not exactly, again, the list that we want to be part of. Uh, that's according to a study by cybersecurity company Surfshark released last February 8. Based on their data, the Philippines had over 705,000 breached accounts in 2023 which is actually less than the 1.3 million record in 2022. Still, this year alone, we've already reported a number of hacking and data breaches among government agencies. So what is government doing about it? Let's ask that question to National Privacy Commission, Deputy Privacy Commissioner Attorney Leandro Aguirre. Welcome to The Big Story. Yeah, thank you for having us, uh, for having Thank you here. for coming all this way. Okay, we, we, yeah. We've talked to several agencies already about this issue, uh, the ICT, ano pa ba? The, the NTC, kasi mo ba yun? NTC at one point. Oh, oh. Oh. But uh, can you tell us what exactly um, is the, the role of the National Privacy Commission in here, in the whole ecosystem? Related to breaches, exactly. Mm. So the National Privacy Commission's mandate is to regulate how personal information is processed. So pretty much for every kind of activity, both government and private sector, it entails the processing of personal information in one form or another. Mm -hmm. Whether digital or even your normal office that has employees, they process personal information. So that's what we look at. 
but part of our mandate is also ensuring that those who process personal information is able to protect the information that they process. Kung baga kayo yung banko ng data? In, we're not the ones that keep the data. It's the companies that mm, keep the data. But mm -hmm. we make sure that how they keep the data and what they do with that data is fair to all the customers, that they inform the customers their data subjects exactly so what they're doing with it. So the SIM registration data? is not with us. It's with the telcos. Mm. But, but how do you exactly mm. like uh, <coughs> regulate mm. what they do with the data, how well mm -hmm. they safeguard that data? Mm. I mean, do you require them to report to you guys? Do you do surprise checks? How does it and all work? And do you have the power mm. to audit? So we do, all, we do all of those things. Okay. So we, we have several issuances related to obligations of companies that process personal information, even, even government agencies. What are the minimum safeguards that they're supposed to have in place? then when they suffer a breach involving personal information, they have to report it to us. They have to let us know what they've done with it, how they've addressed it, what they've communicated to their data mm -hmm. subjects, because the law mandates any company, any government agency that suffers a breach to both notify the commission and notify their data subjects so that data subjects can take precautions. Mm. So if they know that their data is part of a breach, then they can change their passwords, they can do all of these things to mitigate the risks associated with Pero that real breach. talk, no, attorney, um, how often do people follow that? We understand that is the goal, that's how mm -hmm. it's supposed to be handled, but let's face it, you know, sometimes we check, okay, yes, I agree to data privacy policy. Mm -hmm. You're just checking it para maka next ka na. Yes. Right, we don't really read it. I mean, who really reads that? <laughs> Sila. <laughs> I know, Order. right? <laughs> Only you guys. So, um, having said that, um, it might not be like top of mind for people mm -hmm. until something bad happens and then they'll be scrambling. True. Right. But um, where is the Philippines and in terms of like, you know, data privacy, understanding. protecting, understanding, mm -hmm. and following, complying with the rules? I guess just to react to first to what you said about just clicking terms and conditions, clicking yes. Mm -hmm. There was a New York Times article that says it takes 76 working days to actually read through all the terms and conditions and consent notices an average person is forced to agree uh -huh. to in a given year. So, of course, no one really has 76 working days to do that. So we have issued regulation recently on consent on what we require companies to do to make it easy for their data subjects. So instead of giving you a whole contract of like 30, 40 pages, there's only supposed to give you what you need to know at that particular point in time. Then they, they, they layer it. So if the, you need more information, they will give you additional information. Mm. But the gist is supposed to be presented to you and only what is needed at that particular point in time. But worldwide, where do we rank as far as privacy? We're catching up. I think the reason why we're catching up is privacy is not exactly culturally ingrained right. in mm -hmm. Filipinos. Mm -hmm. I, there was a historian and writer that... Because well, we have no boundaries. Yeah, we no, have I no think. concept of a space bubble, you know. Well, we that, like to... that too. Plus, there is no word for privacy mm. in the Philippine language oh. or any, any oh, no. language in the Philippines. Oh, so, no. Carmen Guerrero Nakpil wrote mm -hmm. in 1967 that there is no word, precise word in Philippine or any of our languages mm. because there's no need for it. In the Philippine culture. That's very interesting. That's mm -hmm. very interesting. Mm -hmm. So let's take a real example. PhilHealth, okay. one of my favorite government agencies. <laughs> Massive data breach last year, uh, sometime mm -hmm. in October. Um, if I recall correctly, to the tune of 700-something gigabytes were taken. Supposedly. At that time, mm -hmm. the NPC said, uh, you will investigate, <laughs> you'll leave no stone unturned. Um, what was the result of that? It's and still undergoing investigation. Okay. So the problem with those types of investigations is not just identifying whether PhilHealth as a whole committed a violation of the Data Privacy Act because the Data Privacy Act is a criminal law. We need to identify mm. specific individuals okay. to recommend for prosecution. Mm, so you can't okay. recommend PhilHealth as a whole okay. because you can't imprison PhilHealth. So mm -hmm. you need to identify specific people and that's taking time because you need to go through all of the different meeting minutes, documents to identify who actually was at fault. That's why it's taking so long. That's why it's taking... How much uh, longer do you think you need? 
we are in the process of going through all of the different submissions of parties. Mm. If I understand correctly, it's with our still with our complaints and investigation division. Mm -hmm. After they go through that, they will mm -hmm. submit their fact-finding report to the commission, and we will deliberate and come up with a decision on the matter. Do you think we have one of the most, um, I mean, the strictest uh, data privacy laws? Because I went to the PNP well, uh, the other day to complain about uh, being scammed online, okay. and they were complaining about our Data Privacy Act that has not mm. helped them pursue mm. those uh, who commit identity theft. That's that's what a lot of, that's what they always uh, throw <coughs> yeah, it back balagi, to, right? They, they always like, throw it back yeah, to when you oh, When you we, deal with banks can, especially, yeah. um, they're very tight on account holders, even if you explain. Okay. And apparently, even if it's the police they can't trying to get release info. names, oh, oh, parang information. Tagal, kumbaga, parang, uh, There's a whole process behind it. Yeah. I mean, in your time there, um, what do you think about our data privacy laws? How can we improve it? I don't think there's a matter of it's, it's a matter of improving the law. We're not the only country that has, has the same type of mechanism or framework when it comes to data privacy. I think the most of the problem comes from a lack of understanding in terms of what is actually needed in order to get the information that you need um, under the Data Privacy Act. There's nothing in the law that stops the flow of information. There's nothing in the law that stops our law enforcement agencies from getting the information that they need. It's just that they have to go through a proper procedure, which is you can't just have some random police person go to a bank mm. and ask, wait, what's the name and yeah. account number of so-and-so person? Mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. there is a process that they have to follow, and that process is the PNP's process. Mm. PNP can issue a subpoena, for example. So if they really need information, then they can go through their process and ask properly Kaya to the bank. Kaya lang nakakalusot na kasi ngayon, uso ngayon yung using uh, e-wallet accounts. Okay. And then, hindi naman, kumbaga parang, hindi nila ma-pursue who's behind that kasi they can't get data from the telcos mm -hmm. to be able to pursue the case and now they, they're there with another number. There was a lot no? of misconception on that before and the commission actually issued a decision saying that a lot of the requisites before were actually wrong because there was an instance when, especially during the pandemic, you buy something, you pay through one of these payment gateways, payment wallets, then you don't get what you pay for. Then now you're going after the person, you ask them, hey, what's the name of the person who sold something to me that I never got? The requirement before was you need to get a subpoena from a court, but in order to get a subpoena from a court, you need to know who you're filing. Exactly. against and if you can't mm -hmm. get the name then it's never going to have happened that you're mm. going to get the subpoena and the decision of the commission there was the national the data privacy act was never issued to allow the perpetuation of fraud mm -hmm. it's just that you have to go through again if someone is requesting we want to also make sure that the request is valid like you can't just give the name mm. and number of any person mm -mm. just because some random person asks mm -hmm. so but what we said was show us that there is an actual claim. So screenshots of the fraudulent transactions will help. Mm -hmm. Then from there, they can give you the name because that's actually part of what is considered lawful basis under the Data Privacy Act, that you want to file a case against a particular person who defrauded you. But why in, is it uh, faster in other countries? I mean, I think it's faster in other countries because they've, they're already used to it. Mm. Here, we are used to how things were before. Mm -hmm where you can shortcut a lot of the processes. So again, cultural? I think it is, mm -hmm. but I think it's also both a lack of awareness and also a lack of education. Because we've tried to raise awareness since the commission mm -hmm. was formed in 2016. Mm -hmm. But based on our 2021 survey, it's only 25% of individuals who know about the Data Privacy Act. But awareness is one thing. Education is an entirely different thing. You want to get it a step further so that people now understand what do they need to do. But not just the data subjects, not just us as individuals, but also companies. Mm -hmm. What are the expectations when it comes to companies processing personal information? So let's, let me, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so let's start with the basics mm -hmm. then. What are our basic rights under the Data Privacy Act as, uh, as individuals, as consumers? Okay. So as each data subject under the Data Privacy Act has several rights. We have the right to be informed about how our information is going to be processed. 
companies, government agencies that process our information has to inform us about the nature, scope, and extent of the processing of our personal information, the risks associated with that processing, how long they'll keep our information, who are with the proper contact person, um, how we can exercise our rights as against these individuals. We also have the right to object to the processing of our information. If the basis for processing is consent, we can tell them, hey, stop processing our information. I'm withdrawing my consent. Mm -hmm. We also have the right to access our information. So if you, you can go to a company that processes your information, and you can ask mm -hmm. them, hey, mm -hmm. what information do you have about me? And if, for example, you find out that the information they have about you is not accurate, you have the right to rectify that. Mm -hmm. So there are a whole bunch of rights that are built in to the law. And mm -hmm. I think it's really just a matter of people learning how to exercise. Are you exercise. also handling the case of TikTok? Um, Jen, uh, Jonathan Malaya brought that up last year about how they're, they're studying if uh, there could be a possible data security issue with TikTok. Um, have you studied that? And what, I think this is coming <coughs> on the, the back of um, other countries, like yes. Europe mm. and the U.S., mm. uh, prohibiting uh, uniform personnel or mm -hmm. government employees to download using TikTok. TikTok on their official uh, phones. I think that came about mostly as a result of some national security considerations, mm -hmm. cybersecurity, which is not exactly the part of the mandate. I mean, we look at it because... Mm -hmm. You can't have data privacy unless you're able to protect the data right. that you process, but that's not exactly right. mm -hmm. the mandate of the Privacy Commission. Okay, let me ask you how everything works. Again, back again uh, to the beginning. Uh, you mentioned 2015, 2016 was when the NPC was, was created, yeah. right? Uh, the DICT was created much later than you guys, but yeah. how, how often do you guys interface with the DICT? And also, has this made, has the creation of the DICT? made your work somewhat easier or harder? I think the DICT was formed in 2016 as well. Mm -hmm. So the law was passed, the Data Privacy Act was passed in 2012. Mm -hmm. It's just that nothing happened the first four years. Okay. So when it was created, it was about <laughs> the same time that the DICT was also created. So as far as we've, we're concerned, DICT has always been there. Okay. Our interaction with DICT is really more of policy coordination and budget, mm -hmm. but they don't exercise day-to-day -day supervision over the National Privacy Commission mm -hmm. because we're an independent Correct. agency. Because people live so much of their lives online now, I imagine you guys have so much on your plate. <laughs> Do you get a lot of questions about people's rights online? Do people complain? And then this is, yeah. Yeah. Do you get and a lot of complaints? Because yes. I've never actually thought of you know, calling or writing to For the For example, NPC. and this is something <coughs> I see often, mm -hmm. Facebook groups, even private ones, right? Uh, you have complaint against another member, mm -hmm. you post about them, giving out their details, giving out personal details about them. Is that allowed technically? If you're using it in your private capacity, that's allowed. Okay. But if you now do something with it that will not be considered for personal use, mm -hmm. then that's an entirely no, different story. No, let's say it's a Facebook group of uh, 10,000, 20,000 mm -hmm. members, and I have a complaint against Gretchen, and then I vent about her, and I post about her, giving out her details. Or and maybe her, even uh, like her address, uh, yeah, her cell phone number. Disclosing information yeah. about her work, about her, you know. If uh, the nature of how you're posting it looks like you're really out to like, give people information so that they can dox, Gretchen, then that's not allowed. You mm. can be held liable under the Data Privacy Act for mm. malicious disclosure mm. because mm. of the, the manner in which you did that. Uh, it could be considered with malice, in bad faith. You're disclosing unwarranted information. Then that will be a violation. So there's nuances as well. There it's is? not outrightly right. banned. Yeah, but what about spam, which we get, like, I think everybody with the phone gets spammed yes. every single day. Uh, would you consider, day, can I consider day. that? Because I consider it a violation of my malicious privacy. Malicious intent. <laughs> Maybe without mm -hmm. malicious intent, but um, I'm definitely getting Oh, it's spammed. definitely malicious intent. They <laughs> keep right. asking me to click on links. <laughs> malicious talaga. Sometimes, meron talaga. So first, don't click on any yeah, of those of links, right? Yeah. So also, even if it's so irritating, don't ever reply to those things because the moment you reply they know that this is a live number mm -hmm. then they'll put it in a separate list and they'll oh. keep bombarding you okay. because most of those are either done brute forced or like a random number mm -hmm. generator mm -hmm. so they'll just send to whoever they can send to is that a violation of privacy it 
can be. The problem is it's very difficult to identify where the number came from. Exactly. But especially for those that have your name, and there was a time, right? We got messages with our names on it. Right. So that was an unauthorized processing of the data coming from Gcash and mm. Viber. So they scraped that data, used it for an entirely different purpose, which is also not allowed. But if you keep getting messages from uh, from legitimate companies and you want to tell them to stop mm -hmm. contacting you, you can actually do that. Mm -hmm. You can exercise your right to mm -hmm. object. Mm -hmm. And if they continue to do so, that's already a violation of the law and you can file a complaint. Okay. Going back to uh, oh, what you said, so they scraped the data from Gcash, Gcash and Viber. And Viber. That yeah. was what we found before, which uh -huh. is why so Gcash did the hash. Right, thing. right. So they blacked uh, out some letters yeah. and uh -huh. stuff. So we've seen that they've reacted. Yeah. But um, do they get punished for that? Because, you know, our data was scraped from their servers, assuming. Uh, do the companies <coughs> who hold that data, are they accountable in any way? Or does someone have to complain first? No, they weren't. They cannot be held accountable for that because that was actually a legitimate service that was offered. Like, so you, when you send money to someone, you know that you're actually sending it to the proper person. It's just that someone took advantage of that uh, functionality, misused, yeah, yeah. misused it for an entirely different okay. purpose that was not the intention of Gcash. But mm. they reacted quickly, which is why... They weren't sanctioned. But they weren't sanctioned. Picking okay. up from that, I'm very, very curious to find out. Do you think the SIM registration law has helped curb scams? I think it has. That's why you see that it has changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing. Our laws are important, but people will always find, like bad actors will always find mm. a way. And that's why you see that there's been a shift in terms of how they now do these phishing, the scam right. They're messages. getting smarter and smarter. Mm -hmm. and You're going to take this back to education, right? To education first. We have to educate ourselves. We have to educate ourselves. We have to educate everyone that processes personal information. Mm. And for us as data subjects, we need to know what our rights are. Yeah, absolutely. We need to be able to also know what we can expect from companies and government agencies that process our information. Because at the end of the day, if we don't trust the mm -hmm. company, mm -hmm. we're not going to do business with them. Yeah. And now also, finally, we have a face to the agency. <laughs> oh, yeah, we never... <laughs> we, I think it's never important before. Now, yes. now, this is the person to run to. I think it's okay. important to laymanize yeah. it, we're gonna, though, like, yeah. the, 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 the issue of yeah. uh, privacy. Absolutely. Because you may have to that. leave that there because yeah. we're running out of time. Thank we're you so much for off. joining us, <laughs> National Privacy Commission Deputy Commissioner Attorney Biandro Aguirre. The face of privacy. <laughs> the face of data <laughs> privacy in the Philippines. All right, after this quick break, drag artist Pura Luca Vega gets arrested once again over that same viral video from last year. More on that when the big story returns. Keep it here.
Welcome back. You're still watching Big Story here on One News. And just very quickly, let me apologize for the video that we ran just as we were reading the teens. That was a, a, a mistake. That was an oversight. In any case, um, on the tail end of President Marcus's two-day state visit, Australia and the Philippines signed a landmark agreement on maritime security and cooperation in cyber technology. And China is not happy. At a press conference, China Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning was asked about it and she said the South China Sea is generally stable at the moment. Relevant countries' maritime security cooperation should not undermine other countries' interests or disrupt regional peace and stability. Now, the third agreement that was signed has to do with collaboration in competition law and policy. Australian Prime Minister Al Anthony Albanese also announced a $20 million investment to support the Philippines in reforming its justice system. When Marcus addressed Parliament on Thursday, he said the Philippines was on the front lines of a battle for regional peace. And in his arrival speech last night, he thanked Australia for their continued support on the South China Sea issue. In the spirit of Bayanihan and mateship, we shall forge ahead in fully maximizing the potentials and the gains from this strategic partnership between our two forward-looking, low-abiding maritime states. And back here at home in the Philippines, drag artist Amadeus Pahente, more popularly known as Pura Luca Vega, has been released on bail following yet another arrest over that Amanamin performance from last year. Pura Luca was arrested on Thursday for three counts of immoral doctrines, obscene publications and indecent shows, filed by three churches affiliated with the Philippines for Jesus movement. This is still in connection to the controversial Amanamin performance that Pura did last July, which led to his initial arrest, wherein Pura also posted bail. This time around, the drag artist was released after paying the set bail of 360,000 pesos. But this comes just days after he posted bail for another case filed by the Kapisana ng social media broadcasters ng Pilipinas. Fellow drag artists have started a donation drive for Pura, whose total bail payments have amounted to more than 1 million pesos. Um, at the end of the day, I know the, uh, that this is bigger than uh, what I'm experiencing. This is, it, it sends a precedent for what might happen for artists that are just going out there creating uh, their own art yeah, and expressing themselves and their, um, you know, how they express their religiosity, their expressions of faith. I'm facing these charges uh, with, you know, as, as much as courage as I can muster. As a drag performer and a drag artist, I, I will still continue to tell queer stories through my art. Meanwhile, the Quezon City Prosecutor's Office has indicted a mall security guard for violation of the Animal Welfare Act. Security guard Jojo Malikdem went viral after throwing a puppy off a footbridge back in July 2023. The QC Prosecutor's Office says they gathered enough evidence against Malikdem based on the testimony of a witness. The security guard, though, denied the accusation that he intentionally threw the puppy named Brownie. Malik Dem, who is set to undergo trial, could face up to two years imprisonment and a fine of up to 100,000 pesos. The prosecutor has recommended a 12,000 peso bail for Malik Dem's temporary release. 12,000 pesos bail for that security guard mm. and 360,000 pesos for Pura Luca Vega. For something that she's already paid for mm -hmm. last year. Many times. Um, many and 30,000 for Lorraine. 30,000 for Lorraine Bado, oh, your yeah, absolute for indirect contempt of court. Uh, that, yeah. that, if you put the price of the bail payments into perspective, I don't know. I mean, let's leave the it there. I, I mean, I love puppies. But let's <laughs> leave it there. Well, as the saying goes, all good things must come to an end. It's it, the end of an era. As Gary Valenciano shows us why he was or is dubbed as Mr. Pure Energy one last time this April. Gary V himself announced that he will be retiring from performing in major solo concerts. At 59 years old, Valenciano believes in quitting while you're ahead as he shared the reason for his decision. The Filipino pop icon's final two-night concert will be held at the Mall of Asia Arena on April 26 and 27 as he celebrates his 40 years in entertainment. It's only the ending of a chapter. 
but it's not the ending of a book. For one thing, I am 59 years old, okay? And if there's one thing I don't want, it's in two years' time or three years' time when I again have a concert at the Coliseum or the MOA, people are like this, but they notice. Or it's like, ah, oh, magaling siya, pero medyo gumagal na siya, no? Ay, pa, pero ang galing, galing, galing. Pero grabe, no, medyo hingal na hingal na siya. I don't want it to ever get to that point. I love, kasi natin. I love that. You have to, yeah. you know, when to, you know, when to quit. When to make you know, the exit. Quit, yeah. quit yeah. while you're ahead. Yeah, quit while you're ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm su exit super on a high note. Huge fan of Gary mm. Vee. Um, Who is it? Our generation. Yeah, this I music. I messaged him just, you know, when I saw the news item. Mm. I said I'm gonna be there. <laughs> <laughs> right. That is next. We should have him here nine. too. Before oh, yes. that, yes. we yes. should be for that. Oh. Right. This okay, is uh, an official idea. invitation <laughs> to Mr. Pure Energy himself, in case you're watching us tonight. But before we go, here's our big picture for tonight. 313 dishes were presented at the record-setting 2024 National Hog Day Festival in Quezon City. Which means that local hog farmers bagged the first Guinness World Record for the widest variety of unique pork dishes on display. An official adjudicator from Guinness was present to evaluate the dishes. Among those on display, roasted lechon belly, sinigang na baboy with bayabas in a shot glass, and even pork cooked in Pinoy chocolate. The National Federation of Hog Farmers organized this event in coordination with hundreds of chefs, restaurants, and culinary schools. The National Hog Festival is taking place at Gateway Mall 2 and will go on until March 4. So, pwede magbaboy hanggang March 4. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> May like saludo that. sa mga ano, hog raisers natin. Napakahirap ng industriya niya. Yes. Very, For, very expensive. Yes. And then, pagka tinamaan pa ng ano, ASF. African oh, oh. swine uh, food. Uh, which they were just, I don't know if it's still around, pero di ba last year they had to call hundreds of yes, thousands yes. of pigs. Pero, uh, some of those dishes look really appetizing. A way to make me hungry. 313 mm. different kinds of dishes using pork. This is mm. it. Proof. Saka yung uh, the pork in that chocolate. It meat. sounds so uh, hot Experimental. Cuisine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about national meat. Chicken, I think, will rival pork. Well, because it's cheaper, but I think, um, <laughs> like, the number of people who love liam po. <laughs> so, bagay, may point you're talking to the wrong person. Budget. She's allergic to chicken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you remember. Yeah. <laughs> on that note, on that allergy and the resurgence of pork, that's it for the big story on this Friday night. We're one news all sides all the time. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good night and a great weekend.